Gen AI native interface. This is what a lot of companies have rushed to act on and say, let people use natural language to use the product versus clicking on different buttons and things. There, it's worth identifying that you are part of that new generation. Hi, and welcome to the June podcast. I'm your host, Enzo, co-founder at June. In this show, I'm talking to the most inspiring product and growth leaders out there. We'll share their tips on how to launch and grow your SaaS. No fuss, no BS. I hope you enjoyed the show. Hi, Martina, and welcome to the podcast. How are things? They're great. So it's really exciting to have you here to chat about marketing. I have to say, I really loved your book called Loved. Um, <laughs> when we had big doubts at June on our positioning, our go-to-market, love was the light at the end of the tunnel. It was just so actionable compared to anything else I've read during my studies, for instance. Oh, you, you're warming my heart as you say those words. That's exactly why I wrote it. <laughs> That's awesome. We're going to talk about it in, the, in a couple of seconds. Uh, first of all, I wanted to go through your background so people can understand where you're coming from. So you've been in the Silicon Valley for some time. You started your career at Microsoft as a product manager, which I'm not surprised. <laughs> you then work at Netscape Communications as the director and group product manager. You are responsible for development, ongoing management of clients, servers, consumer, go-to-market strategy, and so on. And then you followed the Netscape founders, Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz, when they founded LoudCloud to lead the marketing. You joined the SVPG, J, a Silicon Valley product group, as a product marketing partner, and you worked there for 16 years, helping companies like Google, Atlassian, FedEx, or Kiva with their product marketing. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people, product people know about SVPJ. After that, you became a board member, an advisor for a bunch of very cool companies like Bishops, Fox, Demand Base. And most recently, you've, you've become a partner at Costa Noa Ventures where you work hands in hands with entrepreneurs of the portfolios to help them craft smart marketing strategies, messaging and accelerate how they build their business. You're also a long time lecturer at UC Berkeley on the engineering graduate school on marketing and product management. <laughs> Wow. That's <laughs> my whole resume there. <laughs> that's, yeah. I'm sorry. I went through all of it. I, I wanted to cut some part, but I couldn't find anything that wasn't relevant. So what, what a journey. <laughs> I'm, I am grateful for the journey. And I will say for those of you that are earlier in your career, if you're sometimes thinking, well, should I do this thing that is different and not exactly what I did before, but it's going to expand the scope of what I understand in the world? reflecting back on my 30 years, that is what has made me really capable at doing what I do now very well, because I just have more scope than most people that only stayed in one domain. Do you think it was an, like you evolve into one single direction across all these years? Or do you think there was some fundamental shift maybe in the way, you know, marketing worked, uh, I don't know, communication worked, and you had to really change gears and change what would you learn or unlearn things? Well, I would say there were there were two paths that brought a lot of shape. One was just my personal growth path. And I would say there I was driven very much by curiosity and learning and a realization of what, when I was at Netscape that what drove me and energized me was learning, not being the best at anything, just being this constant learner where I was always on a learning curve and, and it really, truly, literally gives me energy. Like... I'm not tired at the end of the day or I, I don't like, oh man, I have to learn stuff. I'm like, oh my God, it's amazing how much I still get to learn. So that drove a lot of my decisions, which is why I would jump to different things and also be unafraid of tackling things that are new. That being said, that also was a, a part and parcel of what drove my past. So when I was at Microsoft, the internet happened and I saw that and I said, well, do I want to stay at Microsoft where we're just doing desktop computing stuff? Or do I want to jump, jump on this? brand new internet thing, because it was brand new then. And I was like, I want to be part of the future. And I'm finding that for myself now, I'm watching the mobile evolution, and now just watching the tectonic shift that's happening in all aspects of technology with generative AI and the large language models. And I've, I'm feeling like I've never felt this quick a shift in technology technology intersecting with everyone's lives and us re-envisioning the future and not even being able to comprehend what might be possible. Like 
it's simultaneously terrifying and so exciting. So that those two things simultaneously have driven me. Lovely. I, I love this definition of like a quick shift. I think, you know, oftentimes people speak about whether AI is a big shift, but they rarely talk about um, the speed, the pace. And I think this is really what it boils down to. It's just every, everyone is moving on that, on that bandwagon at the moment. So it's pretty. Yeah. And, and I'd say also having observed shifts like this in the past, the technology first needs to be embedded into products for the world to experience it. And that's the other thing that is different this time around because chat GBT, because a billion people are already touching and using the technology for themselves. So they get to access the power before the whole rest of the product and go to market community has figured out how to embed it into their products. So the advancement and the possibility is already being experienced directly by people. They haven't had to wait for technologists to figure it out. So that's a first. I've never seen that. And, and that's what's so exciting. And also, I think that's what's making it so urgent. There isn't a single person in marketing or in product that I work with right now that isn't trying to figure out what are the implications of this, not just for our product, but for how we go to market, how we do our jobs. So it's just fascinating. It is. I'd love to take a step back on this uh, AI topic and, and kind of like put the foundations and kind of like trying to come up with a framework or some structured approach uh, of how we could look at it. Um, in Loved, the book you wrote, uh, you go through a framework that you call the fundamentals of product marketing and you have four pillars, if I'm not mistaken. I'd love to, uh, to have you run through quickly what they mean and then I'd love to kind of like play around with it together so we can see, you know, how they can apply to founders, early stage startups, and also, uh, you know, how AI is, is fitting into this, this framework. Maybe. Absolutely. Well, the four pillars just quickly are ambassador, strategist, storyteller, and evangelist. And first one, ambassador is connecting customer and market insights. And that is the moment that we are having right now in generative AI. Like the, this is happening in the market. This is happening with customers. And so someone thinking through this through the product marketing lens has to think, what are the implications for how we position our company for what we should be building in product, which is where the strategist aspect comes in. The strategist is shaping how your product goes to market and so that it can actually penetrate the market. So if you just say, oh, I have this great product and it has these 10 cool features but you're not helping people understand why they should care about those 10 features or that, that trade show that they're going to that doesn't have nothing to do with your product, but might be adjacent and an important place for you to be. That's all the thinking that goes, the strategic thinking that goes into bringing a product to market. And that leads to storyteller, which is shaping how the world thinks about your product. This often gets reduced to a positioning statement or messaging, and those are important components but the reason why it's not just the story, a narrative, your messaging is because all of the actions you take combined with your messaging, combined with the position you hope to hold, all of that is what helps to shape how the world thinks about your product. So it is storytelling is kind of the, the foundation, but there's a whole lot that goes into it. And then evangelist is not that you are an evangelist. It's that you are enabling others to be an evangelist on your behalf. And this is absolutely an artifact of the modern world and how it works. I just yesterday <laughs> met with this founder who posted in two Facebook groups. She's a massive social influencer. She posted in two Facebook groups that she's thinking of creating this new product. And for those that are interested to just sign up at this link for a, a, an upcoming beta, no, no preview, nothing like that. She's not an established founder. She had 2000 people signing up for her beta within 24 hours. That's the amount that it influence and these all new, these new channels are just breaking the rules about how we used to go to market. And so of enabling someone else to be your evangelist, enabling others to evangelize on your behalf, your customers, what they say to appear, that actually winds up being more important than any beautiful positioning statement or campaign that we run. Because at the end of the day, we're all so inundated. We are going to trust someone that we know more than any marketing stuff that comes at us. So Enzo, if you said, you saying like, oh, love, you didn't just say love was great. You said when we were trying to figure out what was working or not working with our positioning, love was so helpful because it was directly actionable. You saying that is way more valuable than us just talking about what's in the book. 
And I think this is what the title love boils down to, right? You don't need to be a love product to exist. There is actually, a, I assume, a couple of counter examples. But what you think are the most powerful products are this product with Evangelist, correct? Or is it, is it what should everyone lean toward? Or what's, what's the deal with Evangelist? Why did you have that? You, you may not have it, right? The reason why Evangelist was the fourth pillar was because I think a lot of people over-index on, oh, we need to say the, we need to say this perfectly, or our tagline just needs to be absolutely great. Those are critically important. But what matters is what gets implanted in everyone else's brain and what they wind up saying. And they're not going to say your tagline. They're going to remember something about the product experience or the value that you created. And that's what they pass along. And so you need to make sure that how you build and how you go to market encapsulates that in a way that makes it easy for others to talk about your value mm -hmm. so that your product ultimately is associated with the value other people are talking about. Makes total sense. So, so the, fir the first pillar was the insight, right? The market insight. Yeah, the ambassador, the ambassador connecting right. the customer and market insights. How do, you, how do you suggest people to do that? Do they, I don't know, is it from their intuition? Do they have to run exercises, talking with people? What's, what's the there's no, there? There's, there's so many ways to do it. And the big thing I would advise is make it right along everything that you already do. So one example right now, I'm helping one of our companies revisit their sales deck and their messaging. And I'm listening to gong calls and I'm looking at what sales reps are actually saying. And, and the big thing that I look for is when did the customer ask a question, a clarifying question or, oh, you do that? What about this? Because that those are lean in moments. And it's not, oh, did you say this perfectly? I'm very much looking at what the customer is saying and what they are presenting. And, so, and that's giving me incredible insight about how the market is working. And an example there is this particular company tends to, to message very much for a certain persona toward a certain persona type. We'll call them persona A. And everything I'm seeing in these gong calls is all the questions are more about persona B. And so it really, it, and there's a different language with persona B. And so for me, as I'm thinking, how do we revisit what we say about the, about the company, about the product, we really need to do more to message towards persona B. And that was very evident in these gong calls. But if you are on the product side or on the founder side, every single customer conversation you have about anything, you can always end it with, I'm curious how you would describe this to a friend, even feature exploration saying, how would you describe the value of what this is doing to a colleague? That's giving you a sense of what the salient value is to the person. And that's what we want to hear. That's what we want to capture. So anything you're doing, exploring product, go to market, listening to the customer, those insights, the connecting that then into product is where the magic happens. And the product, so anyone that's doing product marketing needs to make sure that's represented into product. Will we reprioritize what we're releasing this week or next week or in the second half of this year because it helps us better capture a market moment or tell a story better that actually winds up being important to our customers? So it's a, it's a conversation. It's not ever a declaration. And it's always most valuable when product marketing, the function, not necessarily just the person and product have this conversation together. Two follow-up questions. The, the first one is, <clears throat> how do you translate one of these insights and what people tell you into the, the, the right language or the right thing? And then the second thing is, and I think you already, you, you already answered my question, but the second thing is, it doesn't seem like it's a, a number game. It's not like if 50 people tell you one thing, it's more important. It's more like about nitpicking and finding the right personnel, finding the right insight, right? So how do you think about maybe data-driven insight, uh, like feedback versus like the insight? And I'm a fan of all of the above as opposed to one is superior to the other. If you have access to data, to great product telemetry, that's invaluable. I think that's, that's a tool that I didn't have at the start of my journey. So it was much more qualitative, not quantitative. But even back then, we would do studies when we didn't, when we didn't have things like uh, all the product telemetry products that everybody has now, mix panel, amplitude, whatever, whatever it is that you have or use, uh, or Pendo. 
you can actually see how much is this feature used? How does that correlate to revenue? So that stuff's utterly invaluable, but you want to be data informed, not data driven. So that's telling you where people are now. It doesn't necessarily tell you where they want to be or where they should be getting more value. It tells you it's, it's taillights versus headlights. Mm -hmm. And so data is great for taillights and market insights and more of this qualitative stuff is much better for headlights. So that's how I would uh, think about them on balance. Okay, yeah. I heard that once that the outliers of today are going to be the... Um, the main users of tomorrow. So some of the outlying use cases you have in your product might be the default use cases of tomorrow. Is it roughly how you think about the, the evolution of the, of the, I don't know, the user base? And this is where I think you have to be strategic from a market perspective, because you can have an outlier user and use cases for a, a market that is not strategic. So it's kind of like, oh, this one, res this researchers absolutely love this product. However, it's much more important for your business strategically to capture business and industry users. And there it might not be as evident what the outline feature might be. And that's where you have to discover and explore it in. So that's why you don't want to just reflexively say, oh, that outlier, that, that pop, that must be where the market's going to go. You have to look at it through the lens of, Are those customer segments strategic to us? Are those businesses that will help us grow a bigger business? So it's always a, a matter of balance. And that's why it's critically important to always layer the market and customer layer on top of that, that product data. So is, is it the job of the product marketer to, to be kind of strategic or is it just one of the input they, they should leverage in their day-to-day? -day? It's the job of the product marketer to make sure the customer market insight is considered in decision making either. So there's stuff that the product marketer directly controls, and that's more of the how is this product actually going to market and how do we talk about it? How do we make sure that we enable that evangelism through sales or through influencers or whomever else is important. But that first part, that ambassadorship, that is the marriage between product marketing and product management. And that's where you want it to be very much a partnership. The best a product manager doesn't feel like they should be making a prioritization decision without consulting with their product marketing counterpart. Because ideally that product marketing counterpart has always offered interesting market or customer insights. I don't know if we did, if she did that feature, if that's going to have an impact on that persona B that we're trying to position our, ourselves toward. Or I've seen this where you have a product, ro product roadmaps, which I know people are trying to move away from, but there's a product roadmap and everything on it is great. But perhaps the prioritization is a little off from what the, what the go-to-market teams need to actually have a little bit more momentum. So they would prioritize things differently that are uncomfortable for the product team. This feature area that will not be ready for another two months, we actually need to start talking about it right now, even though it's not ready because the market moment is right now. And it's okay if the product team builds into it, but if we don't talk about it now, we're going to miss the window. That's the kind of dialogue that's critically important. AI is one of these, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, a lot of companies have launched AI features that were not ready yet. So it's yes. like product marketing has driven the decision more than, you know, the product team in a way. Well, I would say this is one where the market declared <laughs> this is going to happen. <laughs> and, and then everybody, I think, realized right away how transformative this can be. And this is one that was just obvious to everyone. <laughs> I was like, oh, product marketing didn't call this. But what I do see is product marketers, when, when the product teams haven't yet made that adjustment or aren't moving swiftly toward how, how are we occupying this position? That's where I do see product marketing teams taking the lead saying, if we haven't climbed that hill yet, you're right. I've been so impressed with how many products in market have come out with these absolutely bomber, great versions of the product that take all of this new generative AI technology into account. But there are many that haven't. And they're all like, what do we say? What, how do we show up in market so that we're not behind a month from now? And that's really, this. Are, there's a big race on the product on the product marketing and positioning perspective. So I'd, I'd love to talk about this a little bit with you. So, and get into the details. So, One thing that I find fascinating with AI is that for, that for some companies, it becomes the core positioning, the AI, blah, 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 versus for other companies, 
AI is a feature. So you have like the traditional landing page and then you have a section that says, we have an AI feature. But the insight is kind of the same, right? Like the market is kind of the same, right, for AI. So how do you think about taking one direction versus another? Um, I'm sure you've recommended startup to take one path versus another. How do you think about this one broadly? Totally. Well, before generative AI, that was already happening. <laughs> so there are many companies that I would work with that said, we're the AI blankety blank, or we're AI, there was a, an AI paintbrush being painted on everything. Revenue AI, the, AI is everywhere. Before this recent inflection point with the large language models. So the go to market challenge of where do you insert AI into <laughs> however you go to market isn't new. And what I, I think what I generally would advise companies then still applies now, which is don't just paint an AI paintbrush uh, or put AI lipstick on your company. You actually want it to be associated with the value someone is getting. So for example, there are companies that are just blew up right now that are I would call Gen AI native. So their entire interface model is more natural language based and super dynamic where you query into the product and the product then uses itself on your behalf. That's a Gen AI native interface. This is what a lot of companies have rushed to act on and say, let's let people use natural language to use the product versus clicking on different buttons and things. So there's we added that on as an engine to how you can use our product, but you can still use it in the traditional way. And there are companies that that's just how the product was birthed. There, it's worth identifying that you are part of that new generation because the user base that you have is new. And we've got the customer acquisition curve and you always have those that initial beachhead customer group that are going to be more bleeding edge users. And so there they care about the fact that, that, that it's Gen I native matters to them. You might not say that necessarily, but you'll couch it in some way so that they understand it is this new, really modern way of working where you can simply ask a question and it's spitting out an answer. I'll use Bing as a really great example of being Gen AI native, but not saying it's the Gen AI native way to search. They're leaving all of that behind. Search is an old way of thinking of the world. Ask any question, get answers. That's how they are. They want people to reframe how they engage with information. And then they give examples. Ask for a menu for an upcoming special event. Design a, I, I, uh, design a four-year-old's birthday party. So they give you use cases as opposed to features. Here's how to envision using this. So I think for, if you're a part of that totally new cohort of companies, help people envision how they will do things differently. Maybe you say Gen AI native or not, but you really want to paint a picture around how what's, what you're doing is very, very new. And then if you are in an existing company that's adding these things in, so you're kind of sprinkling AI magic fairy dust into an existing product that's been around for a while, there is not like, here's the formula. There you have to be careful so that it doesn't appear as, oh, they're just using the AI paintbrush. What is very real behind this? And what is the value that you are going to get that wasn't possible before? So I do see a lot of companies doing uh, feature, feature, AI, feature, feature, AI to distinguish this is an AI driven feature. I think that's very reasonable, but it's not the lead. That's, that's fascinating. And do you, something that you talk about really well in the book is the market you position into, which is very important. So in, in the two examples you gave right now, in one case, you are, I assume, in the gen AI market or the new AI market. And in the other case, you are in your existing market with a gen, with an AI feature, right? How yeah. is there, like, how should a founder think about this one? Should you try to be a new market? Should you lean into an existing market? Because I don't know, it's maybe easier to sell if there's already a budget uh, for your market, let's say in B2B SaaS. How, how should people think about this one? Especially founders. There's many founders listening to the podcast. Yes. So there, there are two separate things to consider if you are a founder. One is the technology adoption curve. And this is every product, every technology known to man must go through this curve where you have your early adopter, your innovators, the, the bleeding edge, then your early adopters, then early majority, then later majority. And it takes years to get through this technology adoption curve. So the thing as a founder to think through is, 
that landing beachhead, those innovators and those early adopters, who are those segments that would let me then build a foundation from which I can get through the, that the, that big fat part of the bell curve, because you can only get into that big fat part of the bell curve if those first two foundational groups are really strong and they're the right ones to propel you. So that that earlier example that you asked, where I meant where it's like, you might find that this re researchers love this feature and you build into that. And that's just not a really great market to grow from because they, they don't have a lot of commercial capacity. They do, they're not growing. There's no, uh, business need that's driving it. It's purely their research. So it's not a really great foundation. Maybe it's a later thing. So that's something you want to think through is the technology adoption curve. Who are the segments that will propel me in the future or make me credible to who I want to sell to later because they are there as that foundation, those foundational users. The other question that you're semi asking is, do you evolve an existing category or do you try and create a new one? And I will say it is generally always easier to evolve an existing category, reshape it, remold it, because you're giving people something they already understand, and you're just giving them a way to think about it a little differently, and you're giving them all the evidence of why they should think of it differently. So it's easier to evolve something that exists than to create something new. When might you want to create a, a totally new category? It has to be something that's I'd say quite extraordinarily remarkable where you can, where there, there just isn't any prior existence of something like this. So Alation's a company in Costa Noa's portfolio that created a new category and it was basically correct, creating these enterprise directories for data and no one had done anything like this before. And you needed a certain amount of data for this to be necessary and they had to create a category because there wasn't, there was no way to describe this otherwise, but it was a lot of work. And now they're the leader of that category, but it's rare that that actually is the answer versus evolving something like Tesla, Google, Net Netflix created its own category. But if you think about all of the giants, Facebook was not like every other giant that we, that you might think of, they were in an existing category of some kind. Yeah, they kind of digitalize and modernize something. They just did it differently. They did it better. They did it differently. I think it's something that I struggle to find in pretty much any marketing uh, content out there. But it feels to me that the moment where it clicks and you create your category, whether it's the early days or late, late stage and you've, you know, you've just hammered your market and now you have the budget to try to coin something, is really when you find this magical um, way to explain your product or just this magical way to use your product that everyone just understand. And, and that magical thing, I don't know if you have a word for it, but I just feel it's what, like, what differentiates this product that positioned perfectly well and will grow out of it from the others. You mentioned Gong. Like I've heard so many times what you said about Gong. It's like, I heard a Gong call. Like I sent you a loom. Like, they became the category, right? But recordings yes. already, already always existed before. So what is this magical thing? What, how, how do you get down to this thing? Like, how does it happen? Do you, do you know? Do you know that? If it was a formula, I'm sure it would be published on the internet somewhere. I, and I think that's it. It's, it's not a set formula, but I will say, I believe it's only possible with exceptional product execution. Like every example that you just said, Loom, Gong, the other ones we talked about, Tesla, Google, exceptional in product. Google, Google search at the time that it came out was a completely different way of doing search. Everyone else was building these mega portals and it was more directory like, and they were just stuffing more and more stuff into like, oh, search is something that you want to do, but really you want mail and all this other stuff. And when Google first started, what made them sell past everyone else is we just want to be the very, very best, the very fastest and singularly focused on search. Now, of course, they've built many other things on top of that business, but what let them do that was they decided to be absolutely fantastic in a totally different way in that existing category. So I believe product excellence is thing number one, because that's what people talk about. Like you, you mentioned Gong. Gong is the one product I'd say in the, in the spheres that I work in, I work heavily with product groups and marketing teams and to a lesser extent, engineering teams. 
It's the one product that gets talked. It's a sales tool. It markets to sales organizations. But all those other teams talk about it all the time, less so the engineers, but the product and the marketing teams, it's pure gold to them, even though it was built as a sales tool or a sales enablement tool. That is absolute excellence where all these other teams are extracting value because they've built something that lets me as a as someone focusing on product marketing proxy customer conversations without having to bug sales. And then the product team can do the same and generate word clouds to see what were the themes and what was actually talked about. It's so valuable. <laughs> It is. Did, you said you worked on the gong uh, messaging. Did you say that? No, I didn't no. work on the gong messaging. Do you have a clue of what they did so well in terms of messaging? Like how they amplified the great product into something bigger? Yeah, I don't think it was their messaging that did it. I think it was the product mm. and then consistently providing value to anyone that was in their sphere. So if you look at their content strategy, It was totally non-promotional. It would elevate. Here's some ins. Here are the top six things that you should say in every sales conversation. It wasn't. Here's what Gong can do to make your sales conversations better. It was you. Are you a salesperson? I'm going to tell you the six things that you should say, and then I'm going to show you the data that proves this to you across thousands of calls. So it was genuinely useful. It's one of the few few times that I'm like, oh, every time they send me something, I actually like. Save it in my email because it might be an interesting and helpful reference later. They did a, that. That's content marketing. They did an exceptional job on their content marketing. They kept it a sales free zone. It didn't promote the product. It promoted what, what can you do better in your job? And we're going to give you some of our secret sauce, whether you use the product or not. That I think is very much the modern marketing gestalt, which is I'm just going to give you value again and again and again and hope it, when the time is right. You'll remember me because I kept giving you value. And then we can have the conversation, whatever conversation you want to have, but you will remember me because the average way of going to market is to promote and bombard and just keep turning up the volume and campaign after campaign. The more nuanced, more inbound, more modern way is let me give you value, 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 value. And at some point you'll remember that at the time when the time is right. I love that. There was this great book called The Purple Cow. Uh, from yes, by Seth Godin. It's a yeah. great one. It's amazing. And he talks exactly about that. We used to put this huge billboard about toothpaste. And the, the one with the biggest billboard would basically sell more. And now it's all about being this purple cow, which funny enough, Gong is purple. The b b Gong's branding is purple. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're in Europe, so you know the purple cow of Milka. <laughs> yeah, we actually do have so, I always think of that, but, but that's a great example of brand. It's so iconic. If you walk into any store in Europe and you see purple, you think Milka. <laughs> It is literally a purple cow. But what we are trying to do for technology products is create the same. So it might be in something iconic in our product experience. It might be, so the whole brand that encompasses everything that we do, you mentioned Gong is purple. Every one of these pieces of content, these sales sheets was purple. It implant, you knew that their color was purple. Mm. This is, this is the steel thread of brand and position in everything that you're executing in market. So the product experience was inferred in how they were providing value to everyone without ever talking about the product. And I think that that's what makes them stand above most other B2B companies right now. That is so interesting. This is one thing also of your book, you talk about being bold in your messaging and avoid the vanilla messaging. Um, and we talk about a bit being bold. I'd love if you could give more examples. And also a bit earlier, you said that Google search was fast and easy. And I was kind of surprised because I, I know these are words that you don't want, you don't usually like to use, right, for positioning because everyone is easy, everyone is fast. So does it mean that you have to translate basic capabilities like being fast into something bold and, and sexy or, or is it trying kind of like getting rid completely of these words? How, how do you get to this bold messaging? And do you have examples maybe? Well, yeah. So part of it is bold is relative to your category. So I'll go back to the current moment. So I was talking about Google didn't message any of those things being easier, fast. They messaged nothing at all. It was Google with a box and they basically had you experience mm -hmm. fast and easy. They didn't talk about it at all. So that's 
that's what I loved about it. It was like, we're not going to say it. We're going to be it with exceptional product execution. And I'm looking right now at introducing the new Bing, ask real questions, get complete answers, chat and create, start chatting. So in this case, it's bold to just hang out there and say, we want you to reintroduce you to something that's new. It's been this way for all year long. <laughs> ask real questions, get complete answers, chat and create. They're letting the new world order stand there and say, this is what you can do. They don't care whether or not they are beating Google in total search volume. They want to reframe. Their strategic goal is to reframe how people think about how to engage with information and what comes out. This is a bold choice. So in that category, that is a bold choice. The example that I have in the book, uh, which is Expensify, which is expense reports suck. Every, like the fact that you're choosing to be evocative and to say what people feel, that's very bold. Counter narrative, stop using databases. That's very bold. I have seen this, or databases are dead. They aren't really, but someone's trying to get someone's attention. So that's what I mean with bold, where it make it arrests someone in a current way of thinking, like what? And people worry about doing that because they're like, well, that's not actually true. But it's stopping to get you think of yeah, the old way of doing databases should be, but let me tell you why. So part of messaging, it's not everything that we're saying all the time. That was that would be something you'd use in a campaign or it might be a tagline because you want to arrest people's current way of thinking that vanilla is, hey, it's what everybody expects. I'm just going to tell you what we do, which is important. But if you're trying to grab people first before you tell them what you, what you do, you want to try, you want to try and create a hook. It's not all when you're new. This is particularly for your founders. When you are brand new and nobody knows what you do and what you're doing is very difficult to understand and explain. It's very difficult to be this style of bold unless you want people to stop doing something that they're currently doing. So a company that just launched this week, Feldera, they want people to stop sending all of their data to a data lake or a data warehouse before they run any of the queries. Right? We can actually do it in real time to save you the back and forth between sending data to destination, then processing it and then go and sending it back. So it's a, and there's not an answer to this. It's like, do we tell people stop sending your data to your data warehouse or do we first anchor on what people should be considering us for and where our value is? In the founding stage, you don't know the answer. You need to experiment to discover which is more important. If you sometimes just go out with this, hey, stop doing that. Because you're so new, people will be like, whatever, you're so marketing, out of here. So it is very, very much a balance. Sometimes being bold is simply choosing to be very, very clear without using jargon. Sometimes that's the bolder choice. So I'm, I know I'm not giving you a straightforward answer, but bold is not just try and find a catchy slogan. Bold is dependent on your stage, dependent on your market, and dependent on who you are trying to reach. That's fascinating. Wow. <laughs> Blew my mind. And while you were speaking, I was actually, you, you spoke earlier on about the fact that maybe the best marketing is just to show the product instead of like telling something about it and coming out with a slogan or whatever. I think it resonates a lot with the current marketing. Now, oftentimes now you see the product in the ads, especially for software. And the billboards I've seen many in San Francisco where you just literally see the product and there is like five words. And every yeah. time I'm like, why would you show Airtable on the billboard by the highway? Like people have no time to stop. People have no time to understand what the hell is on this you know, spreadsheet. But that's what it's all about, right? Showing a product the same way we were showing chocolate bars, Milka or whatever. Now we're showing software. Is it, is it what's happening? Is it, is it, I'm trying to, to kind of open it a bit with the future of marketing. Yeah. And what's I would say next, yeah? product has a really critical role to play, but it is, it's the same answer to the last question, which is it depends on who you're trying to reach your state of company and the state of your market. So we look at the iPhone as an example. When it first came out, it's trying to get those innovators. And so the all of the promotion of it was very product centric. Let me show you what the product can do that is different. Because other because you have to appreciate your 
how different you are from whatever it is that you use now. Anyone that was that first V1 iPhone adopter, you were displacing a really cool phone. They, they aren't using crappy stuff. And it's like, oh, I have this uh, really simple flip phone. I'm going to upgrade to the very first version iPhone. You were already a sophisticated user. So they had to show very explicitly, here's what's way better. That is delightful, unexpected. That's wow. That's magical that you will experience by making this, this choice. They got those first users. And because it was all those magical, amazing things, then those, however many thousands of people adopted are showing everybody that they know. That was a great platform from which to grow. There you wanted to be product centric. If you look at the big fat part of the bell curve of when they were adopted by far more people, they would choose one thing to focus on. Like right now, it's the camera. That's it. Like if you look at their mass, uh, it's the colors in the camera are the things that are, are enticing people to, to upgrade. It's not any like, it's not really the chips or any of that other stuff. Yeah, there's all this other stuff, but it's the camera, it's the colors. And because that's why people are choosing to make upgrading decisions. So it's one, one tiny aspect of the product as opposed to all the things that they showcased initially. When it comes to tr more traditional software there, again, it's very much on balance. A more mature category, it is probably veering more and more towards brand, which is, do I trust? Because this has been around for a while. Who do I trust more? I'm about to pay X number of thousands of dollars to have a relationship. I can give it to anybody because the, the products are going to be roughly similar, more mature, more mature categories. The products aren't that different typically. And so it's really, who do you choose to have a relationship with and what are you going to get from that relationship? So that the, that's where brand becomes critically important. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I, it's not just product is or isn't important and or product is the future. It is very, very dependent on the category, but you must always keep innovating your product for all the reasons we started at the top of the call. Such a great way to wrap it up. I love like just to hear your thoughts about where product marketing is going to go next. So, um, I mean, in the last maybe 30 years, 20 years, it seems that product and product marketing got closer. I hope they got a bit closer to each other. Maybe sometime intertwine. Not enough, apparently, right? Where, where, where? I, yeah, I would say my observation just literally in the last couple, I think when Agile hit and product cycles massively accelerated, there was this moment where product marketing became much more about like, oh, product has more output, so we need more output. And so that strategic aspect of product marketing and product market thinking was getting a little lost. And that's really a lot of why I, I really felt the book needed to be written because I'm like, it's all of these things. It's not just one of these things. And sometimes it's not just product marketer that holds that. So my hope for the future of product marketing, number one, is people realize its strategic importance and they resource it with the best and the brightest. Because when you have powerful product marketers, there's no stopping what your company is capable of. And, and two, I think especially... It's a, it's a discipline that hasn't been practiced quite as much outside of the United States. And so my hope for the rest of the world is that they do start to resource it in a dedicated way, that they start to practice it with this in this more strategic vein right from the get-go. And they essentially leapfrog sort of the dead years that we might have had here in the States and just go straight to product marketing being this exceptionally important, great practice for any company that's producing great technology. That's what I wish too for, for the future of product marketing. And I'm sure we're going to get there at some point. Uh, yeah. I, I, I do confirm that in Europe, it's, it's less popular, but it will, it will come. Thank you so much. We're at the end of the episode. Thanks for coming. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was such a great chat. I'll add the references you mentioned uh, in the description. And as a last question, where should people uh, go if they want to find you online? Where, how, how, where, oh, where are you yes. active? Uh, best place to find me is on LinkedIn. I, I share things that I think are interesting and workshops that I teach. So I usually teach two public workshops. I'll actually be teaching one at the end of October and they're because they are done over Zoom, anyone in the world can join them. And yeah, the last week of October, actually, I'll give you the dates. October 24th through October 26th, I will be doing a public workshop where basically each of these principles we'll talk about and we'll practice the frameworks that are in the book, the 
go to market one sheet, how to train that strategic brain, how to improve messaging so that's more on point for whoever you're trying to reach. Going through a lot of uh, marketing, go to market best practices. So I do all of that in the workshop. Awesome. I'll make sure I point to your LinkedIn. Thank you so much, Martina. Have a great one. Thank you. Take care, Enzo. Thank you for listening to the June podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and subscribe. This episode is powered by June. For a better way to do product analytics, visit June.so.